I'm Kwame Holman for the Black Power Chronicles. With us today, Topper Carew, filmmaker, uh, television producer, I want to put architect at the end, musician, organizer, activist, and architect. You have always mm -hmm. said that that was, mm -hmm. that was uh, the through line of, mm -hmm. of your uh, remarkable mm -hmm. career that continues mm -hmm. now. Um, Topper, you were like a lot of the SNCC veterans we've talked to. Mm -hmm. You were in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. uh, you took a Trailways bus to I Mississippi. I, I don't know that, that uh, but I'd like to start earlier than that. I'd mm -hmm. like to start in Boston. Mm -hmm. I'd like to start in uh, with something we've been talking to uh, the narrators about, the, mm -hmm. the awareness of, of being black and what that meant in society. Mm -hmm. You were a, a pioneer in schools you attended. Mm -hmm. in, when did you become aware you are black and what that meant? So I, I grew up in uh, the Roxbury section of Boston, which was a black community that at the time had three black pharmacies, black dentists, black doctor, uh, restaurants, which people from all over Boston came to, um, parades, Masonic temple, churches, uh, nightclubs where you could go and see uh, great acts. And when it was time to go to the fourth grade, my grandmother from Virginia uh, decided that I should go to a school outside of the black community. And that particular school was in a neighborhood where my paternal grandparents lived, so I could use their address. Um, it was a white working class elementary school called the Farragut. In the fifth grade, and so I sort of became aware of the difference, and I can tell you it was, I subconsciously reacted to the difference in the fourth grade by taking a jar of Dixie peach, pomade or whatever they called it, and putting it all over my hair, trying to straighten it. And what it really did was just clumps of Dixie Peach all over my hair and I did this and I realized that my fourth grade teacher, Miss Kelleher, was greatly amused by this. But I didn't know, you know. And so I think that was at a subconscious level. In the fifth grade, I was did on Did you a, know, Tupper, why you were why you were doing that? Did no, you tell yourself why? No. You it was completely subconscious. Mm -hmm. So in the fifth grade, I was standing on the playground. And this kid named Jimmy Crosby, with a smile on his face, walked up to me and punched me in the eye and laughed. And I tried to figure out why he did that. The same thing happened in the sixth grade. Well, in the interim, my grandfather taught me how to box. But there was something in my constitution that I didn't cry. I stood there, I, I took the punch, uh, I didn't fall down, I didn't run, and post-reflectively, I began to understand that was a, an aspect of racism. And the thing that really triggered it for me was uh, I was a distance from home, and uh, I was on a street in a group of white boys yelled nigga let's get him and i remember running for my life this is in that same neighborhood now another turning point came in the sixth grade geography class so i was not beginning to there's something different about me because it was my cousins two cousins and myself who had integrated this school in the sixth grade geography class they asked everybody to stand up and, all right, where are you from? Where are you, where's, your, where's your family from? Well, 
my father being West Indian, I remembered the occasions on that side of the family, the peas and the rice and the music and the, you know, the good times and the stories of Trinidad and Tobago. So when my turn came, after kids had said Ireland, Italian, Polish, Armenian, Albanian, I got a flash thought. And I said, West Indian. After school that day, a crowd of kids were waiting for me. And I'm going, oh shit, you know, I'm about to get taken down. Instead, they said, you're West Indian? I said, yes. They said, well, what tribe? Are you Cherokee? Uh, are you Apache? You know? I said, no, I'm Blackfoot, big Blackfoot. And from that day on, the toughest school in the kid, the toughest kid in the, uh, kid in the school uh, adopted me. He became my best friend because he now had this Indian friend and we went to school all the way through high school together. We were in the same exact homeroom from the sixth grade through high school graduation. So, right, 12th grade, a friend says to me, what's your favorite music? And I said, R&B. And he said, well, his favorite music was John Lee Hooker. And I didn't know who John Lee Hooker was. And that bothered me for a long time. Uh, high school, senior. Test high school, all boys. Uh, about 250 graduates. There were about six or seven blacks, black men, young men in that class. And I had been homeschooled pretty much by my grandfather. So I was learning a lot more at home than I was learning in school. So school was never very interesting to me, even though this was a test high school. And in my junior and senior year, I would consistently hook school and go to the movies. I should have known then that I would be in communications, but I didn't know. And I had figured out how to outsmart the truant officer, how to outsmart the school, how to outsmart my parents. Um, and in the junior year, I got a job as a busboy at a society house at Harvard. And I watched these young men throw mashed potatoes up on the wall, get drunk and throw up, throw roast beef on the walls. They would ask me at 16 years old for dating advice. So this was my first inside exposure to a college experience. And I said, you know what? If this is college, I can do this. So when the guidance counselor, Mr. O'Brien, Irish, 65 years old, called me into the office and said, what do you want to do? I said, well, I want to go to college. He said, well, where do you want to go? I said, I want to go to Harvard. He said to me, well, I think you'd be better off going to the Navy Yard and being a sheet metal worker. My grandfather, when I was in the fourth grade, made me memorize the poem, If, by Rudyard Kipling, who's not a great guy, but it's a great poem. And that has stuck with me to this day. And I sat and I looked at him and I thought, you know, you know, if you can be yourself when all men doubt you. And I'm laughing inside of this guy. And then as God would have it, two weeks later, two months, I can't remember, it's weeks or months now, a black guidance counselor came into the school named John O'Brien. He asked me the same question, and I said the same thing. I want to go to college, I want to go to Harvard. He smiled, and he said, well, something interesting about you, man. You don't have the grades, but you test in the top 1% of this school. He said, you're a curiosity to me. And I said, well, I don't like it. No one's speaking to me, no one's motivating me, no one's pushing me, no one's speaking to my cultural space, right? And he said, I'll tell you what, if you work hard this year, 
I'll get you into another school that begins with H, and that was Howard, which changed my life. So he got me into Howard. John went on to become the first black elected chairman of the Boston School Committee. And it happened because of all the young people he helped. You know, so I gave him his first fundraiser in Boston because in my life, I've always wanted to honor and speak to everyone who has been an aspect of my experience and who's helped me along the way. Freshman year, uh, Howard, I go to a game at um, Virginia State. You know, I'm still wearing this race thing, but now I'm kind of cool about having gone into a classroom, sitting with my black peers and a black professor walks in and teaches the class. I'd had one black teacher in the history of my public school life. You know, other than my kindergarten, not kindergarten, my nursery school teachers. And uh, so that was a great moment for me. So we're going to this football game, Virginia State, and we're going to the after party. Someone runs into the back of the car. Rather than him stopping, they back up, they pull around us and take off. So we give chase. Next thing, the police are chasing us, chasing the two cars. They run up into Fort Lee, an army base. The three cars stop, police come to our car, question Kenny, our driver. Then they go to the other car, who's was clearly in the wrong. Question them, let them go, took Kenny to jail. I'm going, what? Now I've been through the Boston thing. You know, and everybody I grew up with in Boston had one or two runs from white boys. You know, in Boston, you didn't go into South Boston, East Boston, you didn't go into Jamaica Plain, you didn't go into Hyde Park, you didn't go into Rosendale. It was just understood, okay? Well, I'd never experienced this where I saw blatant injustice right before my very eyes, and I'm in the South for the first time, really. So now I'm stuck in Virginia, myself and Hilliard, a friend from Boston, no money, no ride back, call grandma. She sends money to Western Union in Richmond. We get to Richmond, we go in to get the money for the bus tickets, we're now hungry. We try to go into a hamburger place and there's, we wait, 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 nothing happening. And then an elderly black man sweeping with an apron on comes out and he says, can I help you boys? And I say, well, we, we want, we're hungry, we want to get a hamburger. He said, I'm sorry, we can't serve you here. So those two incidents caused me to join NAG, the Nonviolent Action Group, which was the SNCC chapter at Howard. That's how I got there. And I then went to Mississippi and there were some, you know, campaigns along the way. Architectural school, I was good in ma me mechanical drawing, so I had no particular proclivity toward architecture. But it wasn't until I took that Trailways bus, I wanted to go by myself, because I want to experience this in a deep way by myself. Um, I remember sitting on those buses and you could feel the change when you're Danville, then you finally got to Atlanta, and then you out of Atlanta, there were white people who would stand in the aisle rather than sit next to me for hundreds of miles. I'm going, damn. So when I went to Mississippi, that was a uh, paradigmatic experience for a city boy from Roxbury to suddenly be in the deep south, the red clay, dirt roads, living on a sharecropper's farm that was a half a mile from where they dumped Emmett Till, a quarter of a mile from where a shack had been shot to the ground rather than take the black man alive who had fired on a deputy. They would got 30 boys, man, and they just shot into this place for four hours till it fell over. We were there about two days, and I was with Freddie Mangum, who had picked me up. He was a Howard mate, and uh, Ed Brown was with us. And I remember, and so it was a one-way road coming up to our house. We used to keep a lookout at the base of the road, hidden in a barn. And 
we got the radio thing saying people on their way up the road. It was three truckloads of gunmen there. And I'm like, we're hiding in the grass, man. And I'm going, this is real, man. I mean, they got rifles and shotguns and all. They're looking for us, man. And so we'd figured out how to booby trap the road, you know, with wire trips. So at night, the road would light up. And it was a one-way road. And when they realized it was a one-way road, they didn't come up there too much more anymore. But I remember um, when I got drafted, uh, I had been sending uh, letters from the time I was 18 uh, to the draft board saying that I wasn't interested in fighting in Vietnam. Uh, and that I remember one of my last letters saying, uh, draft me for Mississippi. My draft board head was a woman named Louise Day Hicks, a noted racist in Boston. So I used to write to her personally. And uh, eventually they just said, we don't want you, man. <laughs> we don't want you. And uh, because of Mississippi, my attitude toward architecture changed. I said, oh, you know what? This could be a power tool. I can use this in the interest of equity and justice. Changed my opinion about architecture. And I came back from Mississippi and the, my hair started to grow and I started to read different books, you know, this, the NAG reading list, and I was still curious about architecture, but the thing that interested me the most about it was uh, it taught me how to think in a computational way, in an elliptical way, rather than in a nonlinear way. It, uh, it taught me how to solve complex problems with multi-tiered solutions. It's very much like filmmaking. And that began to interest me. Then when you start to think about that and the way it can serve justice and equity, uh, it became more interesting, more curious. And I knew I wasn't the same person anymore. Then when the word black started to unload as a cultural thing, we're not Negroes, we're black. And I gotta tell you, man, there were people in the Howard Architectural School that would wanna fight you if you referenced them as black, man. You know, and architecture, so my, my original idea of architecture in terms of role play was, okay, tweed sport coat, roll of drawings under the arm, uh, pipe, Austin Healy sports car, right? I'm f and that's what all the Howard all the Howard dudes were fronting like that, man. Everybody had a pipe and a tweeds and, and uh, uh, saddle shoes, man. And so I was kind of there. Then all of a sudden, man, that started to change, man. I started to wear dashikis and African garb, you know, and hair got long. So one of the professors... Why did you do that? Why, why did you why make that, that change? Why, why, the, why the dashiki over the tweed? Because intellectually, I responded more to the notion of the historical value and the, the, the lineage of the black experience. And also the notion that uh, I felt more comfortable I felt much more comfortable being black, man. And it just made more sense to me after, you know, you, you listen to Malcolm and you listen to Baldwin, you the Richard Wright books, man, you know, and you're in this, this group of students at Howard who seem to make much more sense than the students who simply want to imitate, you know, the architect in the Ayn Rand Fountainhead book, you know? 
the people who wanted to be us rather than replications of them. And that the beauty and the power in the us rather than the powerlessness and mirroring, you know, Eurocentric architecture and Eurocentric life. You know, it just felt more authentic and more real. You begin to understand the basis of jazz, the basis of swag, the basis of our food, you know, the basis of our expression, and how it was a great place for that. And so the artists and the theater people were like on board with that very quickly because that's where a lot of the messages and a lot of symbols, you know, were birthed. And I just didn't feel a kinship with the bourgeois experience. I just didn't feel comfortable with that. And so I've always had a rebellious tendency. I mean, I got expelled from nursery school, man, because I took on a bully, you know, and uh, he was bigger than me and, you know, he's bullying everybody in the nursery school. It came my turn. I'd already thought about it, how I was going to take him down. So I took him down and my mother had to come to the nursery school. They say, you know, yeah, your, your boy's a little disruptive, and so we're going to have to have him sit on the bench for a while. He can come back in two weeks if he behaves. And, but I will tell you that during my lifetime, every time that bully saw me in the neighborhood, as big as he was, he would cross the street. And so I was like a hero when I came back to uh, nursery school, man. Everybody giving me their graham crackers, man. I was the dude, you know, and it was not intentional. It was just that I was not going to let that go down with me. So I think it was my junior year. It was the uh, year immediately after Mississippi. A, uh, <clears throat> one of the uh, professors had a firm in Georgetown, uh, Leon Brown. Thomas Wright, <coughs> and they, um, they had a project to redesign a public housing project in Southeast. And so by that time, I'm thinking, well, uh, there's only one way to do this, and that is I have to go and be there. I have to be a part of that experience. I have to immerse myself in that community and talk to people about what they see. At the time, there was a... Uh, an architectural critic named Wolf von Eckhart, who was at the Washington Post. Man, he was fascinated by this. So he wrote about it. Well, that didn't help my student life at Howard because professors had never been in the newspaper or interviewed by Wolf von Eckhart. So that created a little bit of tension. And when the senior project at the school uh, came to be uh, residence for the vice president of the United States, I said, I'm not doing that. I don't think that's appropriate at this black university, that that's what we should be doing. We should be doing a house for the president of Ghana, right? So I'm like in that space. And so I left. Uh, there was a place called the Institute for Policy Studies that heard about what I was doing, and they invited me with some support, and I basically opened up a storefront on, uh, I, th I think it's 1812 Florida Avenue. It's a little storefront, floor was sagging. You know, this was, go I was going, I'm the community architect. I'm now a community architect, and uh, you know, I'm wearing coveralls, I got long hair, and kids are peeking in, man. They say, well, who is this, man? And I somehow, I don't know, it wasn't me, man. It was some kind of divine intervention said, you know, you should start thinking about these kids. So I made this very small space, highly convertible, so they could come in and they could paint and they could draw and they could play with words. And that was the beginning of the, of the new thing. In the meantime, a number of things happened. The American Institute of Architects was not liking me. Uh, and I would get these very threatening and menacing letters because 
uh, they said, you're not a registered architect and that, you know, you are subject to penalty, to uh, prosecution, all these kind of things, all these kind of crazy things, right? And I just said, fine, do what you got to do, but I'm going to continue with my work. So my first meaningful project, and it's probably one of the most meaningful projects in my life, was when the uh, downtown school committee, with the cooperation of the municipal government, decided to take the homes of, through eminent domain, of a number of elderly black families. Somehow the number 49 sticks in my head. I, there's an article in the archives somewhere of the old Evening Star. What is it, the Evening Star? There's an article there that can give you all the details of this. So I became, I became their architect. And the issue was whether a used car lot should be saved and the home should be taken. Well, that's a justice issue. That's a justice issue. What, when is it that these families will ever buy homes again? They're invested. So we took on the issue. I, I got a, some architectural friends of mine um, and uh, we marched downtown, photographs, site plans, the whole thing and present, and we won because it was so logical. And the used car lot was gone a year later. The homes would have been gone, the used car lot would have been gone, and people would have been out of their thing. You know, they would have been out of their homes, man. So, so I continued doing that kind of work. So two years later, the American Institute of Architects invites me to be on a national panel to talk about my advocacy work. This is after they've been trying to bust me up, man. And uh, what's so interesting is there was a person from Yale there who asked me to come up to speak. And so I had forgotten about it. I was in a, there used to be a, a club that Charlie Bird hung out at, at 18th and Columbia Road. I can't remember the name of it. Uh, but I was in there one night listening to Archie Shepard, who was one of my, Archie, Archie oh God, what's Archie's, what's his last Archie name? Archie Shepard. Archie mm -hmm. Chef. Yeah. So I was in there. And, but it, this is a folk singer, not the horn player. Yeah, oh. Okay, so, so he was playing there. Yeah, so. And I said, oh man, I'm supposed to be at Yale in the morning to talk. I said, listen, you feel like driving up to New Haven with me? So I said, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'm going to show my slides and talk, and you're going to play. So I went to Yale that morning. And uh, I did my, it was 9 o'clock in the morning. I'm showing slides and talking about architecture. He's playing. And they say to me, would you like to go to lunch? I said, sure. You know, Archie, you want to, should we get a free meal? And he says, yes. Yeah. So they offered me to come there to teach. Uh -huh. And so at the, uh, how old was I? No degree. Um, I was 25. I was 24. And they said, would you come and teach architecture? And I did. And I, I said, but, you know, I, I said, I got to tell you something. I'm busy in D.C., so I'll, I'll come up one day a week. And they said, well, if you'll come and lecture, we'll even work out a degree program for you. So that's why I now have two degrees from Yale, because I did my degree work. I commuted. I jump on a plane on Thursday night, lecture on Friday, spend the whole day with students on Friday, then go to New York, catch some music, see some friends, come back to D.C. and run the new thing. Uh, so there are two other very interesting political asides to, there are many actually, uh, to the architectural thing, because it really started as an architectural place. One was we actually, I actually put together the team that designed Resurrection City mm -hmm. for King. Uh, uh, the other one was, um, uh, the beginning of the mural movement, I'd put a mural up at 18th and uh, Florida, and all of a sudden I'm getting these notices that this is against the law. So the police chief shows up, 
And I'm going, it's art. No, they're going, it's advertising. I'm going, no, it's art. So suddenly there was a court case. And this was a great court case. Uh, I had to bring in museum directors and curators to testify on my behalf that it was art. And if I was wrong, I, was, I think they were going to give me 30 days and a fine for having, and it was political, and so, but I won. So that helped to secure the position of murals in DC. Um, the other thing that uh, emanated out of uh, the architectural experience was we became the architectural advocacy team for Bishop Marie Reed, who was the chair of the Morgan School. And the Morgan School by now was community controlled. They got to design their curriculum, they got to hire their teachers, they got to hire their principals, so we became her advisor as they were beginning to contemplate the design of a new school. Um, then the other thing that happened on the architectural side we um, you know we helped to foster the community advocacy movement. So after I left Howard, suddenly all of my peers and all of my colleagues were now moving into the community advocacy space. And then a year later, all of my colleagues were at Yale in the master's degree programs. Um, so inadvertently, there was a great deal of influence that unfolded. Um, in the artistic space, um, the kids were very important to me. You know, I don't know why. But I mean, you know, if, you, if suddenly, you know, you see at your door a group of young, sparkling, dreamy kids. You know, you can't, you know, and they, you know they're curious about you, and you know you have something to give. You don't know what it is, but you do it. And uh, the, uh, I think I got the uh, equity bug when I took a peek at the, the DC Commission on the Arts it was all white. Now they claim they had a couple of people on there. There's, a, there's an article about that too. And um, the executive director was white. And so I went, on the, I went on the assault and I said, this is not right. Because at that time the city was 85% black and you had a, where's our, where's our, right? And so that got crazy because I got read into the congressional record. Uh, somehow HUAC got up in it. And all I'm saying is, where's our space? Right? And they went nuts. And I think at the time, George Stevens was the chair. He and I became friends, as did I become friends with his mother-in-law. Um, but it was kind of gnarly, you know, when you think about that. And then there was another occasion when with the kind of intensity that I could bring, you know, I could fill a room. Um, I went after the National Endowment of the Arts and went directly at Nancy Hanks. And there was another person there, I can't remember his last name, Michael somebody. And I kept, I kept going after them on the equity piece. And so finally they relented because I was so wonderfully annoying and persistent and tenacious that uh, they created something called the Expansion Arts Division, and they actually offered me that job, and I was not interested. I was far more in love with community work, and I, I knew at a fairly early age that I wasn't really employable. You know, I went to work at the post office during one of that first Christmas break at Howard. I lasted three days, and I just knew I was not a good employee, so I've always had to be fairly independent 
uh, because in my life I try to find that dance between equity and excellence. You know, I have not given up my creative ambition, you know, but I feel a sense of responsibility in terms of the equity piece and so much of that is due to my exposure and my engagement with SNCC and I credit them just about anywhere I go to speak because that changed me and made me more powerful and gave me greater intention. It, and it allowed me to be, I, I have a term that I use, it allowed me to be culturally audacious. Cultural audacity is being willing uh, to intentionally express you know, yourself in the creative space with an understanding of the aesthetic platforms that preceded you and allow that cultural resonation to feed your intention. And so our struggle against injustice and colonialism and all those other things uh, when you become historically informed, begins to feed your DNA in such a way that that becomes a part of who you are. So in the creative space, I always look to disrupt. I'm not interested in uh, making art like Picasso. He informs me, but I also understand that he was informed by Africa, right? So I believe in uh, cultural audacity. I also believe in uh, creative bodacity. Bodacity is a word I made up. And I always explain it like this. Uh, once you decide that you are going to resonate with your cultural experience and your history, all right, you become like Jimi Hendrix. Jimi Hendrix used to sleep with his guitar when he learned that he loved the guitar. But he did something that was even more profound. He played on the left side upside down and backwards and dared to use feedback and subsequently revolutionized in a very interesting way, disrupted in a very interesting way the, what had preceded him in the rock and roll guitar. They hated him in England, okay? But he had also allowed himself to be informed by the blues. If you look at the Hendrix interviews, he'll tell you that the basis of everything that he did was the blues, all right? That's cultural bodacity. It's where you dare to take an instrument that sells at the guitar center, you take it home, and instead of doing this, you do this. That's bodacity. If you look at our audacity and our bodacity, and you decide to embrace that, we have impacted the world. You know, the, I like to use, um, and so the new thing, in an interesting way, was a place. It was a doorway for the young people in filmmaking, photography, dance, African percussion, Melvin Deal, you know, uh, a whole range of artistic experiences. We had a door open, and then we provided tools, and then we gave the code. The code is the skills, you know, the experience, the ability to... Uh, uh, create, innovate, invent, make mistakes, try it again. And uh, if you look at how we impact the world when we try to, when we, when we embrace our culture and we allow it to resonate with ourselves and then with the end users, our community, uh, it's no wonder that Jay-Z goes platinum. They ain't all black people buying them records. Uh, so. I think that uh, the, the mo one of the most interesting stories for me is uh, NWA. Um, uh, NWA was informed. They got the code from listening to their parents' records. They got the cultural infusion, the resonation from listening to their parents' records. And then one day they got the means of production. 
They got the means of production, an affordable little box that you could put on the coffee table in the dining room or on the dining room table, whatever. And you could begin to make music and you could sample other aspects of our cultural experience. And you could make these things and you learn the code. What was the code? You read the manual. So now you have the means of production, you have the cultural resonation, and you are creating and actuating things that have affected the world forever, okay? Uh, fashion, food, speech, you name it, it has all come as a result of a belief in our cultural experience. Now, that's powerful because that's where the messages, the rhetoric, the of these symbols, all of these things evolved from that experience. So the new thing was basically a place where you could get the code, you could get the access, uh, you could get the skill set, and you could make the product. And so that's a very, so I've been, I've, I use that formula in all of my work. If you were to look at my work from then until now, it's the same exact formula. You know, it's code, you know, access, tools, and cultural resonation, man, our culture. So, the, so, my, so, so while this is under the auspices of the Black Power Chronicles, I was in the black art space, equity and, and uh, excellence, because uh, we should never sacrifice excellence. Excellence is John Coltrane. Listen to that horn, you know, and you'll hear Africa. Listen to that horn, you'll hear Harlem. Listen to that horn, you'll also hear Russian folk music. You know, and it's no wonder that every jazz saxophone program and in every institution practically in the world today bases their whole curriculum on John Coltrane's horn. But it was that culture that informed him. You can hear the rage, you can hear the beauty, you can hear the excellence, you know? You know, and it's just a very, very, so that's, that's, yeah, right? Yeah. So I was going to ask, listening to your, your story, the kindergarten kid who fought back, the adult who fought back against uh, the architecture establishment, the uh, activist who saved people's homes, you were exercising power, you were using your consciousness and using your power to make things happen. Was that black power? Was that, or is black power just a political thesis? And how does it, how does it, how did it exist when you first heard the phrase back in the, in the 60s in your mind? And isn't everything you've just talked about Black Power, or was Stokely Carmichael, Marion Barry, were they talking about something different, an actual implementation of some applied political strength? See, I, th I think um, Black Power validated my intention, and my intention was uh, to make black people more powerful in their own um, ownership, identification with the, with the black cultural experience. Uh, because I do think that we, that the, the large group, the intelligentsia, intelligentsia certainly, under, certainly understood the, the magnificence of our art, but I've, I was trying to popularize that and trying to, uh, at the new thing, trying to get uh, young people to identify with their culture. So I was more, in the black arts movement, but the black power movement pretty much validated me. I felt like I had an ally in that journey, and I felt like we could feed that movement through uh, our, the kinds of films and support that movement through the kinds of films, the kind of art, uh, the kind of dance that we made. I mean, the African heritage dancers and drummers were in residence at the new thing. And that was the spirit of the new thing. You come on 18th Street, you hear those drums, you know, and that consistently, and Melvin consistently reminded us of our identification with the African, the diasporic experience. And so uh, for me, uh, 
Black Power was an affirmation. And it was affirming my identity. And it was make, making me more solidly identify with my identity and want to advocate that that identity be um, propagated for as many people as possible. Um, you know, we used to do these concerts at St. Margaret's Church on Connecticut Avenue. And the intention of those, con of, of those, of those concerts was to validate jazz, to validate other aspects of black music. Um, we had a radio show on WAMU for years and it was called The Root Music Show. It was talking about the rootedness of our music, you know, going all the way back and coming as far forward as, as uh, very, very progressive jazz. So Black Power was a validation. I was not, I was cultural, it was political, but it was cultural and it was validating and it was affirming and I felt that it gave me certain, a certain kind of energy, a certain kind of strength, a certain kind of uh, uh, resonation, a certain kind of intention, but it also uh, fed the notion of actuation and I was, I, I didn't like the idea of uh, Eurocentric cultural dependency or Eurocentric values defining who I was, when in fact I had come to see that we were much more than that. You know, it doesn't mean that, you know, a black singer should not, you know, uh, be in one of the great operas. It doesn't mean that at all. But what I would always listen for in Leontine Price's voice was that little tweak. I would go to see her because I was looking for that little tweak. You know, I would go to see a black classical piano to, so I could hear that little tweak. And I was just looking for that little peak inside and did they do it? You know, so it doesn't dismiss Eurocentric excellence and our participation in that, but it historically our experience had been excluded in the in a mainstream, big kind of way. And I felt that that was an equity issue. And uh, that was an equity issue. Um, I was just thinking about something. This is, this is a, a sidebar, but, because um, I sometimes, you know, at this stage of life, you often become very self-reflective. And uh, when I was 13, I wanted to be a priest. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, it's kid stuff. I mean, you're an altar boy. You know, you're in the pageant every Sunday, sometimes twice on Sunday, right? You can't help but get swept up in that, man. And so that's, that was my first passion. That was the first thing I wanted to be. And then uh, classic girls, you know, that just sort of wiped that right off. And I said, you know, my faith obviously isn't strong enough, and I'm 13, I'm way too young to, to understand, you know, how you commit to the intensity of faith. And I did not come from a, 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 an Irish Catholic family where, you know, if you've got five sons, it's, it's known that one of them is going to go into the priesthood. All right, so I got to DC and I'm doing my work. And I've always been a uh, faith person, man. That has always kept me afloat, man. Uh, you know, even coming here, I pray this, man. So, um, and I'm not afraid to admit that publicly because that's part of my experience. So in my, when I was here in DC, I had a chance to go again. Um, John Walker invited me into the faith um, and the, uh, what I was asked to do was to uh, conduct four seminars as testimony to my faith. And, uh, my faith wasn't strong enough. And because I, I was somehow convinced that in the fourth seminar, I was going to get struck by lightning because I was not strong enough. And if I were to do that, it would have been, I, wouldn't have, I could not have been honest. You know, it would have been a con job. And so I wasn't ready. But I made a decision 
And that decision has fueled and fired me for the longest time. So, you know, whilst I give a lot of credit to Snick, I also give a lot of credit to Faith. And I've decided in my life that my work is my ministry. That's what it is. There's no two ways about that. When I uh, left Boston and went to L.A. and had a rich career, a struggling career, a tough career, you know, it's, it wasn't luck. It was hard work and tenacity and uh, spiritual veracity. And uh, I had success. I had the kind of success that many people dream of. Uh, it was not without sacrifice. It was tough for my family, you know, uh, but we survived, you know. But it was faith that kept me afloat. So when I finally got back to Boston, where my great mentors in life reside, um, I had two options. One option was the MIT Media Lab, where I am now. The other was the Episcopal Divinity School. So I went to both and interviewed. And when I realized the endurance requirement of the Episcopal Divinity School at my age, I decided that if I wanted to continue to be effective through work because I'm not going to retire, I'm gonna go out with my boots on, that I could probably accomplish much more through the Media Lab if I see my work as my ministry. So it was that interesting combination of snick fire and faith fire and that dance and that balance, you know, because I've, in life, I have had rascally tendencies on occasion, but faith pulls me back. And uh, in life, I've had uh, the possibility for great compromise. I've been offered some sensational jobs over my lifetime. And, but I've, the snake has pulled me back because I realized that I'm not, I would never be a great bureaucrat. I would never be a great employee. And so I just have to kind of uh, pedal through life with this artistic temperament that has great political inclination, that had a bar set for him by SNCC and a bar set for him by faith. So. It sounds like in your lifetime as a black arts proponent, black power, as you say, validated you. And it seems black power was validated by the kinds of things the, the black arts movement did. Did it not feed back the other way, the, the validation when the political side of a black power would observe the things Topper Carew was doing, the things the many other people in the black arts movement were doing. Were they one and the same? Were they a symbiotic circle or, or what? Yes and no. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, uh, a, par a person who I have great love for and great respect for, and we became very dear friends. Uh, in the early days of the new thing was a wonderful adversary, Gaston Neal. Uh, he was easily more bodacious and more audacious than I was. And he was uh, easily more pure in his intent. So I, I've, I had detractors, um, but I also had incredible supporters because I was sort of in this hammock situation uh, you know, if you make films, you want to submit them to film festivals and you want to win. But, you know, uh, I never sacrificed uh, my personal, historical, cultural, or political integrity in anything that I did. Uh, and uh, I was always very interested in the masses and reaching as many people as I possibly could. And I got in that habit by uh, producing concerts. And uh, 
but I had detractors. But I, but I must say that Gaston fed me because, you know, um, he set a very, very wonderful standard of excellence and uh, creative and cultural exploration. So I paid attention to everything that he did, everything that he did. And there was a, there was that, there was a group like that that was easily more intense than myself. But I was, there was no disconnect. Uh, there was more connect than not. Um, but, you know, uh, I, uh, I, mi I miss him. I mean, you know, and I'm so glad, he, he and I were glad that we had bonded and that we had figured out who we were. He was an awesome individual, um, and he was probably the, the standard bearer uh, in Washington during his time. Uh, but, you know, you got to keep another thing in mind. I'm doing architecture, which is, uh, I wasn't doing, you know, villages in Kenya. Uh, and I'm doing kids, and I'm trying to get them into the artistic space with skills and excellence. So a lot of my work was a little bit different than, than uh, the sort of propagation that, that he advanced. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, Gaston Neal with his per perhaps stricter adherence to the marriage of the black arts movement with the, with the black power political oh, yeah. movement, nonetheless, oh, yeah. I'm sure approved of Topper Kuru. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. We, were, we, we ended up being great friends. You know, and, and I, I found ways to support him. Uh, when I was on the DC uh, Arts Commission, I was probably his strongest advocate in terms of sending grant money his way. You know, because at that time the commission was still tied to, you know, institutional politics. And so to be inside and to be able to argue on an advocacy basis for the kind of work that he did, uh, I was there for him. Sure. I have to ask you one last uh, thing, Topper, because we are here in uh, August of 2017 mm -hmm. when in the news uh, is a great deal of attention going to uh, reactions from some in the country to uh, the taking down of, of Confederate uh, uh, memorabilia mm. around the, the country and and violent acts um, that are that for many are indistinguishable from the men you saw riding on those those op uh, flatbed yes. trucks yes. back in the yes. uh, back in Mississippi how do you reflect on on where the country is coming from someone who has experienced the the halls of the highest levels of the art and architecture world of the mm -hmm. of the the broadcasting and uh, mm -hmm. entertainment world how should people look at the return if you will of of those images in 2017 compared to 1967 um Personally, I'm appalled. Uh, and personally, uh, there's a bit of disappointment when uh, I think about the enormous investment that I've made and the enormous investment that others have made uh, in the interest of uh, justice and equity in this country. I do think that I do think that those statues and those symbols must be eliminated forever. Uh, and the fact that they have existed for this long and that uh, there has been a, a toleration for such uh, has finally come to light. And I must say that I was probably dismissive in that space because I didn't think about them. I didn't think about them because I felt like we, through legislation and the rest had gotten past that. Okay. I think there will be an enormous challenge to the black community and I want to 
speak to that first. Um, because a lot of that challenge in the front is triggered by us are being in presence. I think there is, and, and the, here's, here's what I see as the danger. Uh, there was an algorithmic research project at Carnegie Mellon that talked about how the Tea Party came into existence. And basically what it said was they only needed 10% of the population saying the same thing all the time to impact the other 90%. Very important. Because if you look at the history of the civil rights movement and you recognize that it was a very small group of people saying the same thing consistently over and over again until we impacted the other 95% of the population. See, so that's, that's a very important thing because now you have this white supremacist organization that has captured the message. And they're saying the same thing over and over and over again, and it's having impact. Okay, so that's where the danger is. So we have to allow things like the Black Power Chronicles to inform us. We have to let the history of the civil rights movement inform us so that our young people do not think that King's birthday is a shopping holiday. So, I think we have to stand firmly behind nonviolence. It's hard. It's hard. Those people own the majority of the guns in this country. I think we have to ignite something that I refer to as progressive patriotism. We cannot be afraid to be patriotic in the name of fortifying those democratic institutions that have been the basis for our ascendancy, even though they have not been totally pure, although they've been manipulated, although there is a lot of undue influence on them, we have to take a very, very, very firm stand. And we have to realize that it's not going to be, nor is it ever, you know, a situation where 100% uh, of the population is going to be on board with what it is, right? And I think that we got to get busy because uh, they don't like us, man. You know, and I've always, I've always believed, by the way, this. If someone consistently exhibits irrational behavior, and I think racism is a rational idea. It was a construct created by the English to justify slavery. It has no ethical basis. It has no uh, moral basis. It has no uh, uh, Christian basis. It has no Buddhist basis. It has no basis. It's a, it's a flimsy idea that, like the Tea Party, has taken hold. And Anytime you know somebody, friend, family, anybody who consistently um, exhibits irrational behavior, they refer to therapy because it's a mental disease. See, I think racism has never been properly treated. The last time we had any mass therapy around the notion of racism was the civil rights movement. And so we're now at a very interesting place where that mental illness is surfacing. It's an illness that allows a 20-year-old man to get in a car and plow into a crowd of people. And it's a mental illness that, allow, that, that had a guy in Oklahoma, I don't know if you heard that one, where he was ready to set off another Timothy, Timothy McVeigh bomb and they caught him just in the nick of time. That's illness. That's an illness, and we need to understand 
how deeply rooted that experience is and how like cultural audacity and our resistance to those things has become a part of we are of who we are we have to recognize that that illness has become a part of who a lot of those people are they're like off the charts man the nazi thing the clan thing man it's insane i was looking at uh, a piece last night and you know, it's talking about how the elections in 1920 and 1924 were impacted by the Ku Klux Klan. How they had control over that election. You know, so uh, I'm very, um, I'm very interested in some form or fashion to figure out how I can make a contribution to uh, a, what I call, uh, persistent optimism and uh, uh, constructive disruption uh, in the interest of uh, fortifying the intention of democracy. Uh, because I think this issue is right now bigger than us, but we have always been very instrumental and very much a part of uh, uh, the marches toward justice in this country. Um, and I don't, th we got it. So this is beautiful because it's going to inform young people. It's going to give people courage. It's going to let people know that we've been in dark places before. This may be this, the toughest one. And I'm kind of feeling that. I mean, I don't know if it's because I've got a historical view, you know, due to, to my lineage, but I feel like this is one of the Analytically, I feel like this is one of the darkest periods in history, man. And it's very, very difficult. I know people who are in s states of grief because of this, trying to figure their way out of this. So I go, we need culture, <laughs> we, need, we need a code, which is strategy, and we need actuation. And uh, we have to recognize that the opposition is mountainous, but Nelson Mandela recognized that, and A. Philip Randolph recognized that, and King, he, he realized that. Uh, so I, I will maintain optimism. That's where I'm at. Mm -hmm. Tapper Karu, thank you mm. very much. Excellent. Good to see you. All right, man. Cool. It's fantastic.